Hello everyone! Last week, we talked about Varian finally sitting down with the Horde of Feramor, which was interrupted by Corona half Orkan. Tensions ran high between the factions, and would only flare up with events like the Wrath Gate and the Battle for the Undercity. Within Icecrown Citadel, Varian showed the first signs of figuring out that not all of the Horde were the master's murderers that he knew from his childhood. And the next part of his story arc is not that much in game, but it plays out in the novels, so let's begin, shall we? First off, we have the novel Stormrage, which as the name implies is more about Malfury and Stormrage, but Varian did have his part to play. The Emerald Nightmare was spraying across the land of Azeroth, and both the Allies and Horde had their victims, but this of course was not widely known at first. A mist was forming outside of Stormwind, and some of their people, including Enduin, they no longer woke up. Varian believed the Horde be responsible for it. There was no proof, but to him it made perfect sense. There were far too many elements amongst the Horde that could not be trusted to keep the peace. The Orcs aside, and they were also amongst those of whom Varian was suspicious, the King could not see any reason to believe in the honor of Blood Elves. These were High Elves, who had turned to absorbing demonic magic after the loss of their vaunted power source to Sunwell, and had subsequently become addicted to the fell energies. Nor did they have any faith in the Undead Forsaken, who claimed to be free of the Lich King's mastery. Of all the Horde, the Tarn were the only ones who did not immediately make the Stormwind's ruler want to reach for his weapon, but since they sided with the Orcs, that made them untrustworthy as well. Of course, what Varian didn't know was that the Horde was suffering just as much from the Nightmare. Now, like I said, a lot of the story shifts away from Varian, and it focuses more on saving Malfurion from the Nightmare and taking the battle to Xavius. Eventually, Malfurion was saved from the grasp of the Nightmare, but there was still a war to win. The people of Azeroth were still trying to fight and defend their land against those who were taken by the Nightmare, and they now struck out against former friends and allies. Malfurion made contact with those still resisting, to stand together in the Emerald Dream to fight back against the nightmare at its source. Varian heard Malfurion's voice in his mind, and at first he refused to lay down his arms and fall asleep. But one of his blows did not knock out the target, but instead killed the innocent sleepwalker. He snarled and told Malfurion that whatever he was planning to do, he should do it quick. Under the guidance of the Archdruid, Varian, and so many more from all factions and races, they entered the Emerald Dream. It was Varian who was chosen by Malfurion to lead them all, and of course, at first Varian wants nothing to do with it. The king looked outraged at the sight of the orcs. I won't lead this filth. Let the nightmare take them and be damned. As it took your son, and so many others in Stormwind City, Malfurion said, Only by defeating the nightmare can you ever hope to have Enduin return to you, and that can only happen if we all work together. Varian visibly struggled between his hatred and his love, and eventually love won out. Now though, many of the Horde looked reluctant to join any force led by Varian. But then the Tarn leader Bane, he took up a place by the human. I will trust that this one chosen by a friend of my people will act with honor towards all. The Tarn's declaration shattered resistance and the forces of Azeroth under Varian's leadership, they moved out. The King of Stormwind raised his sword, what was actually part of his dream form, and he led his host forward. The Archdruid stared at Varian as the King moved on, and just for a moment, Varian's countenance had seemed to change to something else, to the image of a wolf. A name came to mind, an ancient spirit revered by many races, including the Night Elves. It was Goldrin, Malfurion thought, recalling the legendary Ancients. The White Wolf had slaughtered hundreds of demons during the War of the Ancients, before falling to the great numbers. Yet his spirit was set to live on, watching over those he favored. May you be one of those, the Archdruid concluded, aware they had likely imagined what he had seen. May Goldrin watch over you and all those marching to meet our enemy. And watch over them it did, yet the victory did not come easy. As the force of Azeroth battled with the might of the Nightmare, their physical bodies were still under attack, causing their dream form to die with their physical form. Images of their loved ones assaulted their minds and affected morale, but as the army tried to hold the Nightmare's attention, people like Malfurion, Turan the Whisperwind, Bro Bermanto and Fura, they worked together on fighting the root of the corruption and the Nightmare Lord Savius. The day was eventually saved. Malfurion returned to lead his people together with his beloved Turanda, and as he restored the dream forms back to the body, he spared a brief moment to save her one sight. That of the king rushing to his son, and the pair holding one another tight. The Fred the Nightmare was dealt with for the moment, and it wouldn't resurface until the expansion Legion. But of course, this is Warcraft, and peaceful times don't often last for long. Just before the Cataclysm, the people gathered within the Cathedral of Light to remember the thousands who had sacrificed their lives in the war against the Lich King. Varian and Enduin, they were present of course, but even Jaina Proudmoore had made a way to Stormwind. Two Night Elf Sentinels stepped into the Cathedral to speak with King Varian. Despite the treaty between the Alliance and the Horde, there had been an attack in Ashenville, and this was no ordinary skirmish, the attack had had been brutal. The victims were hacked up in pieces. They were skinned. The sentinels weren't sure if they were alive during that event, but their skins were hung up and written in elven blood were the symbols of the Horde. 
By now, you can probably imagine Varian's immediate response to this. His Logar side took hold, accusing Fra of being behind this and blaming Jaina for not letting him kill the orc when he had the chance. Jaina did her best to calm the King of Stormwind. She had fought besides the war chief, had been personally involved in the negotiations for the treaty. They had no proof that Fra had actually ordered this attack and it wasn't like he could be held responsible for the actions of every single orc. The Defiage Brotherhood were humans as well. Should Varian be held responsible for their actions? This blow struck him very hard, especially what he had lost to the Defiage Brotherhood. For a moment, she thought that she might have reached him, but then his brows drew together in a skull that was made terrifying by the brutal scars across his face. He did not look like himself now. He looked like Logush. What if you were wrong, Jaina? And what if I'm right? You've been known to be a poor judge of character in the past. Now it was Jaina's turn to freeze, stunned at the words. He was hurling Arthas back at her. That was how Logash played, how he had won in gladiatorial combats. Dirty, using every tool at his disposal in order to win at all costs. Many of us knew Arthas well, Varian. Including you. You lived with him for years. You didn't see the monster he would become. Neither did his father, nor Uther. No, I didn't. But I'm not making the same mistake again, and you are. Tell me, Jaina, if you had seen what Arthas would become, would you have tried to stop him? Would you have had the guts to kill your lover? Or would you have stood by, peace at all cost, a mewling little pacifist who... Father. The word, uttered in a boying tenor voice, cracked like a whip. Varian whirled around, and Anduin stood in the doorway. His blue eyes were wide, and his face was drained of color. But there was more than an expression of shock in his face. There was bitter disappointment. Before Jaina's eyes, Varian changed. Gone was the coldly raging anger of Logush. His posture shifted, and he was Varian again. Anduin was disgusted and disappointed at his father's reaction. Again, it's his son that's able to reach the king, as he spent some time with the Sentinels in a much calmer mindset, and he makes the decision to investigate this further, and if Thrall is truly behind this, then he will march into Orgrimmar himself. Jaina promised that if the War Chief of the Horde was truly behind this, she would be marching at his side, and Varian apologized for his behavior, and he realizes that Anduin yearns for peace, where it seems like he simply yearns for war. He wants his father back, not Logush, and although the king had merged into one single being again, the transition of finding balance within himself, that was still going on. The king doesn't like having his boy around with him, while he's still trying to determine where the king ends and the Logush side of him begins, so they decide to give Anduin a hearthstone, which he can use to visit Jaina at Veramor at any time he wants. Varian also understands that his son isn't weak. In some cases, he has shown more strength and wisdom than most adults around him, but he does believe that Anduin is a little bit soft, and at some training with the dwarves, that it could be very good for his son. He suggests that the prince should visit Magni in Idaforge, and Anduin really warms up to the idea. He could check out the Explorers League, he could stretch his legs outside of Stormwinds, and Varian would make sure to talk to Magni and encourage Anduin's training. The prince had already shown great talent with throwing daggers and a bow, but his fighting skills were simply not there, not even after the dwarves got their hands on him. He did have an interest and affinity to the light, as he meets up with High Priest Rohan, and he dreams of a world where every city would welcome whoever stood at the gates with open arms and kindness. Anduin truly yearned for a world of peace, yet the world of Azeroth itself, it was in turmoil. This was at the brink of the Cataclysm, the Black Dragon Aspect Deathwing, he was about to break out and try to bring about the Hour of Twilight, and this did not come without a warning. Earthquakes were already taking place, some had been crushed beneath their own homes, and Magni Bronsby decided to use an ancient time to ritual to communicate with the land and figure out what exactly was going on. Instead of just communicating though, he literally became one with the land as his body was turned into a crystal. Anduin, his father, and all those aware, they grieved for this heavy loss, and Varian insisted for Anduin to stay within Ida Forge during this time. This was a chance to actually help the people. He had made some good friends there, and the fact that the Prince of Stormwind is staying there throughout this difficult period, that would send a strong signal about how highly they regarded the dwarves. It wasn't a pleasant place to be at right now, but not everything you do as a king would be pleasant either, and Anduin knew that his father was right, and he did want to help. But the place would become a lot more unpleasant, as Magni's daughter Moira, she and the Dark Island Dwarves showed up. Moira Bronzebeard, she'd been kidnapped by the Dark Island Dwarves years before this, and although her father believed that foul magic was at play, Moira actually fell in love with Emperor Fauruzan, leader of the Dark Island Dwarves. He showed her kindness and affection and the respect that she never received from her father, simply for being born as a woman. They eventually married, they had a child together, and now she had shown up to take her rightful place as heir to the throne. With the strength of her Dark Island Dwarves, she placed Ida Forge on the lockdown, she held Anduin as a hostage, and although the way that she went about it was absolutely wrong, technically she was in the right, as she was the one to succeed her father. You stand before Moira, watch your tongue. 
Now remember that Hearthstone, the Jaina had given to Anduin to visit her at Fedamore? That one was very handy right now, as the prince could use it to escape the city and escape Moira's crawls. The timing could have been better though, since just as he showed up, Jaina was in a secret meeting with Bane. The Horde was dealing with its own inner turmoil, since Thrall had left the Outlands to figure out what was going on with the worlds. He had left Garrosh behind as Warchief. Karen had then challenged Garrosh to mock Korra, since he believed that the new Warchief had ordered an attack on the peaceful meeting with Druids. But again, like the attack on the Night Elves, this was not by the Horde, but by the Twilight's Hammer clan. Garrosh's weapon Gorhal was poisoned by Megafa Grimtotem, which led to the old bull's death and Bane losing Thunderbluff to Megafa. He had shown up for Ada Fedamore, since he didn't know who exactly he could trust within the Hordes, and Enduin had now accidentally barred into their meeting. Now apologies for not going into full details with all these storylines, but this video is about Varian, so I have to do my best to keep it focused on him. Anyways, Jaina then used her magic to contact Varian, who is of course very relieved to hear that his son is safe. The prince then informs his father about what happened within Idleforge, that her claim to the throne was legitimate, but that the way she went about it, she didn't have to do it like this. No, she doesn't, the king replied, as he asked Jaina to keep Anduin at Fedamore for a little bit longer, while they would publicly pretend to be as baffled as Moira would want them to be. They'll let Moira believe that she succeeded in hiding her coup, while Varian has a plan. He gathered members of the SI7 to infiltrate Idleforge, they went through the shutdown deep run tram, and forcefully removed Moira from her stolen throne. When eventually Anduin finds out about this from his auntie Jaina, he tells her that she must send him to Idleforge, and of course, the mate refuses at first. This 13 year old heir to Stormwinds should not be sent in the middle of danger. Listen to me Jaina, please. If father carried out this attack, a lot of people are going to die, and succession will be thrown into confusion. Instead of coming together as a people, the dwarves are going to find themselves in the midst of another civil war. I've got to try and stop him, don't you see? I need to make him understand that there is another way. Anduin's words are eventually able to convince her that his destiny is to rule Stormwind one day and that he can't face the destiny if they keep on treating him like a child. A quick portal later, and Anduin found himself with an Forge just in time to stop his father from making a very big mistake. He had dragged Moira out of her bed into the open area near the forge, where crowds were already starting to gather. He hauled her to him roughly with one arm. His other hand was at her throat, pressing the sword against the pale flesh. Behold the usurper! Varian cried, his identity no longer a secret, his voice echoing in the vast space. This is the child, Magni Bronzebeard wept countless tears over. His beloved little girl. How sick it he would be to see what she's done to his city, to his people. The gathered crowd stared. Even the Dark Irons did not dare to make a move, not with their empress in such immediate jeopardy. This throne is not yours. You bought it with deceit and lies and trickery. You have threatened your own subjects when they have done nothing wrong and bullied your way to a title you have not yet earned. I will not see you sit upon this stolen throne for one moment longer. Father. The voice cut through the haze of Varian's rage, and just for an instant, the blade that he held to Moira's throat wavered. Then he recovered. He did not take his eyes from the dwarf as he replied. You should have been here, Anduin. Get out! This is no place for you! The prince, once more, was the voice of reason, shared wisdom and truth with his father. Despite what he might want, Moira was the rightful heir. His father was not some vigilante. Destruction was easy, but creating something good, something right, something that lasts, that was the hard part. Varian wanted nothing more than to make the usurper pay for what she had done to his boy, his beautiful son. It was hard to not simply bellow in anger and plunge the blade into the usurper's neck. To know that the threat to his son was forever ended. He could do it. He could do all that and how he wanted to. The low gush side of him was roaring fiercely. It would be easy to kill her, but they had to think of what was best for the people of Idleforge. In the end, his son was able to calm the wolf down, and Varian decided that he did want to do what was good, what was actually right. She had shown that she was incapable of ruling Idleforge by herself, so he came with the plan of letting all clans be represented by a leader. They formed the Council of Three Hammers, with the Dark Iron, the Bronze Beard, and the Wild Hammer clans, each of them having a voice in this city. Just like himself, she had to do better than she was right now, and the dwarves around them, they started to cheer. His son was smiling and nodding with pride. See, father? Anduin said, pulling back to look up at him. You knew exactly the right thing to do. I knew you did. Varian smiled. I needed someone to believe that for me, before I could do it myself. He replied, come on, son, let's go home.
So far, Anduin has been the stabilizing force for Varian, but you can tell that there's an imbalance within the king. Onyxia's magic separated and reformed him, and the process did not come without complications. Varian is struggling, and so was the world of Azeroth itself as the cataclysm finally took place. Deathwing made a return, the walls around Gilneas crumbled, to which the Gilneans joined the Night Elves and underwent the ritual to regain control of the Worgen curse, while War Chief Garrus decided it was time to take charge of the Horde and lead it to a better future by conquering the land. War was upon them, while Tyrann the Whisperwind had a vision granted by a loon, one that showed her that Varian was golden and chosen, and that he would stand a battle against the orcs. She and her husband knew that the Alliance would need a leader in the wake of the Cataclysm, and with this vision, it seemed like Varian was meant to be that leader. The people of Gilneas, led by Gen Greymane, the same Greymane that once upon a time had joined the Alliance of Lordaeron and had complained about the gold that they were spending on Edgard Keep, they wanted to rejoin the Alliance and add the war and strength ferocity to their cause. A summit at their Nasus took place, in which all the factions of the Alliance were represented, and they not only wanted to decide on whether or not they should accept the Gilneans, but they also wanted to see if anyone would arise to guide the Alliance. Now you might ask yourself, why did the Gilneans need to be accepted again, if they were actually part of the Alliance of Lordaeron? Well that's because sometime after the Second War, Greymane decided to build a big wall around his city, separating Gilneas from Lordaeron. He didn't make Lordaeron actually pay for the wall, but no one was allowed to enter Gilneas, not even when the human refugees begged to be allowed in during the time where the Scourge ran rampant across the lands of Lordaeron. They had turned their back on the Alliance, they got hit by the Worgen curse, they lost their lands, and now they dared to ask for support, for an alliance, from from those that they had refused to help. I have made some terrible decisions years ago, Greymay said. I abandoned the Alliance for what I thought was the right course for my people. That proved to be a sorry mistake. What I'm saying is that I thank you all for giving us this second chance. The King of Gilneas definitely regrets his actions and he hopes to make the Alliance see that the war of ferocity and their fury that they can be an asset to them, that the mistakes of the past will not be repeated. And at first, it actually seems like most members of the Alliance that they're warming up to the idea of letting them into the Alliance. That is, until Varian Rin stood up and spoke his mind. He still remembered what Gilneas had done. It was true that Stormwind had not directly participated in the Third War, but it had been a strong supporter of the Alliance. Stormwind had also been going through much more turmoil at that time, and Varian had been in the heart of most of the turmoil. King Varian silently stood. The effect was immediate. The shouting around them died. The two Night Elves and Gen, they stared at Varian, whose face revealed nothing of his intentions. Members of the Alliance, my good Night Elf host, I like to speak. Even Prince Anduin appeared uncertain as to what his father planned, although he did not seem worried, only curious. Everyone knows that there's no love lust between Stormwind and Gilneas. Everyone knows why. Other quiet fell upon the assembly. Gen's expression was unreadable as he waited for Varian to go on, but his ears lay flat in concern. The benefits that an ally such as Gilneas offers us, it's obvious. While our skills in combat more than match those of the orcs and their allies, there's always been a hunger that the Horde has thrived upon that we, so civilized, no longer seem to have. The Worgen offer us that righteous hunger to overcome all obstacles in battle, to keep the Alliance from being splintered or merely sitting back as the orcs take one land after another. Gen's eyes widened, and even Malfurion could not help but feel his hope stirred at such a speech. I consider damned long and hard on this. I promise you, Varian told all, such an ally can help us easily hold the Horde's ambitious in bay, maybe even push them back. The king indicated Gen and the Gilneans. An ally of such honor, of such courage, I'd be more than pleased to fight beside. His words brought cheer. Even the worgen could no longer restrain themselves, several of the younger ones giving out short howls. Varian now turned his attention to Malfurion. Archdruid, you called before for a vote by acclamation, a vote that I interrupted. My apologies for letting that happen. I'd meant to ask to speak sooner. Smiling, Malfurion answered. I would be happy to call for it again, King Varian. That won't be necessary. The human monarch's expression went through a stunning transformation. A dark call spread over it as Varian eyed Gen Greymane. Varian spat in the Gilnean's direction. Calling for it again would be a waste of time. The Lord of Stormwind snarled at his counterpart below. For I'd never give consent to allow these mongrels into the Alliance. Shouts of consternation erupted, especially amongst the Worgen. The one of us, Edric, took a step toward Varian, but Gen grabbed the young warrior's shoulders and pulled him back. The two worgen bared their teeth at one another, Edric quickly becoming cowed. Honor and trust, these are what the Alliance needs, not these beasts that even when they parade as men were lacking in both. What happens if they choose to cut themselves off once more? Will they even bother to give us a warning? 
Can we trust them even to do that? Varian snapped his fingers, and his retinue joined him on their feet, and win the last and most hesitant. As I have already said to many, I find nothing worthy, nothing honorable in this pack of hounds. And so, I will never vote I to their admission back into the fold. And with that, Varian led Stormwind out of the summit, as chaos erupted amongst the other representatives, and Malfurion Stormrage watched all of his hopes crumble before his eyes. As you can tell, Varian isn't too happy with the Gilneans, and the summit seems to be a bust. But the Loon's vision has shown them that Varian was the one, and Malfurion was not about to give up. He went over to talk with the King of Stormwind, who refused to listen to his words, and his son Anduin overheard everything that they said. He realized that if a 10,000 year old elf can't convince his father to see reason, to stop living in the past and think about the greater good of the people, then surely he himself had no chance of succeeding. He has made up his mind and decides to join Prophet Velen and the Drenna for a while to learn more about the light, something that he had a great affinity towards, something which he had spoken about with Velen. The boy turned to leave. Something snapped inside of Varian. He saw his beloved Tiffin again, with their infant son snuggled in her arms. Tiffin then faded away, leaving only the child. And then the child began to fade. Varian could not let that happen. Without thinking, he lunged forward, snaring Anduin's arm. The prince let out a cry. Some of the overwhelming fear faded, and Varian realized that he was crushing Anduin's arm. I, I... The king released his grip. Anduin, his face filled with shock, grasped at his injured arm. He knew as well as his father that Varian could not only strangle a foe with one hand, but had done so several times. Few men there were who could match the strength of the legendary Logash, and now in a fit of utter madness, he had used the same might, however briefly, against his defiant son. Despite his desperate attempts, this act only pushed Anduin further away, and he left his father to join up with Velen, while Varian took to drinking away his sorrows. Reports had come in about Garrosh and the Horde attacking within Ashenvale, but to Varian, all of that seemed to matter little. He had lost the one thing that meant the world to him. The rage and fury that had kept him alive in the arena, it seemed to destroy everything worth living, and a solution had to be found. It was Malfurion who suggested the king to, rather than staying here and drinking even further, that he should join him for a hunt. This actually interested Varian, something to focus his full attention on, and as luck would have it, the appointed hunting grounds by Malfurion, they were also the hunting grounds of the Worgen. Graham and Varian, they ran into each other, and they ended up in a contest as to who was the better hunter. Varian wanted to win, and embarrass Gen in front of his own people. The Gilnean would see that their vaunted leader, that he was still a failure who would only bring them further to ruin. The idea that by shaming Gen, Varian wanted to lessen his own sense of failure, it had crept into the Lord of Stormwind's mind, but he had quickly and soundly buried that thought deep. They were tracking down a boar, which led them right in front of a big bear, ready to maul them to pieces, and nothing in this world bonds people better together than fighting for their lives. Together, the King of Stormwind and the King of Gilneas, they were able to bring this mighty beast down. A quick killing blow, Varian complimented again. I simply finished your work. The Gilnean ruler returned. This kill is yours. The hunt is yours. Varian shook his head. Hardly. I was hunting a boar. A man who hunts a rabbit and brings down a deer is applauded. A man who hunts a boar and brings down a bear, he should be acclaimed. And with that, Gen looked to the sky and unleashed a powerful howl. A howl that honored both the kill and the one who made it. His call was taken up by the other worgen, all saluting the skills of the King of Stormwinds. Gen finally finished. The howls of his followers ended with his. He faced his counterpart again, only Varian was no longer there. Varian did not believe that he deserved the honor they were giving him, so it left him to think, to reconsider his past assumptions about the Gilneans, for his love for his son, his people, and for his hopes for redemption. There were others that were struggling hard with a darker side of their nature, perhaps even in a way that he himself never had, and therefore he needed the help of Greymane. Gen was confused at first. They had no lands or gold to offer. Varian had everything, but he did not have everything. The Worgen had learned to deal with their ferocity. They had learned to control their Worgen side, and Varian needed help with controlling his. Gen not only nodded an understanding, but he even showed some sympathy rather than disdain. I always wondered how anyone could survive what you did and stay intact inside. I didn't. And so, Gen led Varian to the ritual site, where so many wargs had gone before, and he would be the one to guide Varian into the ritual. First, he had to eat a moon leaf, a symbol of both nature and the mother moon. This would help prepare his mind for the ritual. Next, he drank from three wells. One of them was Tranquility, which would rekindle the peace and joy lost so early in his life. 
One was of balance, which would keep his mind and body as one, thus enabling him to stand with both parts unified for the struggle that he was going to take on. Then there was fury, which would enhance the first two mugs he took, and also built within the strength needed to confront and hopefully command deaths which most risked the ritual ending in failure. They sat down together, as Varian plunged himself in his memories, those points most relevant to his life and the choices he made because of them, for good or for ill. In the first vision, he was a child again, learning to ride his first horse from his father and being encouraged during his training. Varian realized then that he had handled the blade barely better than his own son, but Lane's encouragement, it had helped Varian better to learn from his instructors. The tranquility of those days, it softened Varian's heart. That was when the assassin Garona half Orkin struck and Lane fell dead on the floor. The capital stormwind was taken over by the orcs and everything wonderful about his childhood vanished. No peace, no tranquility. But unlike in times past, Vary now realized that the good memories, they had always remained with him. Even though violence had taken his childhood, it could not erase what he had lived prior. Nonetheless, Varian allowed it to do so, and that was what he had always done. But not this time. Despite what had happened to his father and to Stormwind, Varian at last embraced what had been before. His father had never ceased loving him and had proven that time and time again. He would always have his childhood. The past could not be changed, but that meant for the good as well as the ill. Tranquility. The next memory was that of his beloved wife Tiffin, who was calm and a wondrous golden spirit, contrasting sharply with his wild dark self. Varian loved her for the first time again as she strode toward him, even though the first thing he did when she spoke with him was to brush her off in such an arrogant manner that any other person would have rightly fled. But Tiffin did not. Again, she danced with him, laughed with him and brought out the good in Varian, the balance, the unchecked. In some ways, even more than his father, Tiffin had helped Varian to become the king that the people loved. And yet, the people were the very ones who had killed her. She lay dead at his feet, slain during a riot, an innocent victim of a time when everything had gone mad. Reliving it, very nearly slipped back into his darkness, but that had been the ultimate disdain for his beloved. Tiffin had made of him a better man, a worthy leader. Varian finally saw that he had constantly insulted her memory with his actions. Tiffin would never have acted as he had. She had always forgiven, always sought to do her best for those that she loved. If Varian hoped to redeem himself to her memory, he would have to do the same. He steeled himself against the images of her death, doing instead what he knew that she would have hoped for him. He was right to grieve, but he also had to move on and learn. Most of all, he should continue to learn from her life, use it as an example of how he should confront all the issues that he continued to face, not only as a father, but as a man and a monarch. Balance. The final vision was that of their beloved child Anduin. He was all that he had left of family, the most precious member of all, for in the boy was his mother. It had been difficult to be the father that Lane had been, especially without Tiffin, but he had recalled some times when he and Anduin had laughed together. He also recalled the fear he had of losing him, of people harming him, the fear that drove him to rage, which in turn made the king the very thing that he had tried to protect his son against. He again saw himself grabbing Anduin's arm and was suddenly reminded how that rage and that fear fueling it had sent Anduin away. With that realization, he now turned on his own rage. It could be a powerful, devastating force, a powerful tool in battle, but it was also a double-edged sword. One that had to be kept under control. And so Varian held tight to his rage, as if it were a horse needed to be broken, and he worked on mastering it. It would no longer aid in furthering ruining his life. It would have a purpose. Varian knew only one purpose too. If battle was the single place where his rage did him any good, then it would be where he would channel that force. He would let it fuel his strength against the dragon Deathwing and the orcs and their allies. The rage finally surrendered to his will. He had broken his hold over him and now it would serve Varian, not the other way around. Tranquility, balance, fury. What had started when two became one again has now been finished as Varian took control of his inner demons and he became the true champion of Lokash, of Goldrin. He literally became empowered by a demigod and he and the Worgen, they focused the powers on Garrosh and the Horde, who at this time, they were trying to take over Ashenville. The Worgen's timely arrival and added strength combined with Varian's leadership, it turned the tide of battle. While Garrosh and Varian, they got a chance to resume the fight they had started within the Violet Hold. This time, the orc had Gorhal to match the legendary Shalamane. 
name, but Varian had a very powerful buff, he had the power of Goldrin. It's possible that the King of Stormwind might have won their duel, but we would never find out as their battle was interrupted and Garrus's Corcoran, they dragged the Warchief away. It was clear that they had lost this battle here, but one battle did not make a war. Garrosh envisioned again the realm that he would build, and in envisioning it, once were knew that it would happen. He let them off, already making plans in his mind. This was not over, not until he had won, and not until Varian Rin was dead. That encounter would have to wait though, as the day was won and the alliance they reconvened to vote on the fate of Gilneans and their acceptance within the alliance. This time, all voices, including that of Varian's, they voted aye, to which the worgen howled of pleasure. Varian also apologized for his unreasoning, unfocused rage that had brought calamity on him and all that he held dear and only served to divide the alliance, stating that that Varian Rin who reigned with such rage was now dead. But in dying, he had learned that it wasn't the rage that it was at fault, only he. The fury, the anger must have a purpose. It must be the righteous anger of one defending his family, his home and his friends. It must be the kind of fury that keeps all the loved ones safe from those who would rip them away, be it Deathwing, be it the Horde, or whatever might try to stand against the Alliance. The faction's leaders cheered, Tyrod and Malfurion, they watched as the vision granted by Elune had come true. Logash, Varian Rin, champion of Goldrin, was already speaking to the other leaders as to what they should do in terms of Ashenvale and beyond. Never again would he be able to turn from his allies for the mistakes they had made, not when Varian could at last see how theirs were so insignificant compared to his. I'll do what I can, he whispered. I swear I will, and win. And that's where we'll leave it for today, as next week we're going to conclude the story of Varian, since there's still so much to cover. The High King of the Alliance has found his balance, has been restored, but the world around him is still in turmoil. Garrosh Hellscream has a vision for the world, for his horde, and will not let anyone stand in his way of achieving it, while the Black Dragon Refion, he warns the world of the coming Legion. That however, is for next week, so for now, thank you very much for watching everyone, subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!